Welcome to another TNTI special. Our guest today is a wrestling historian, a wrestling author, having written the Shapkanese from Triumph to Tragedy, uh, and the man of all talents, the extraordinary life of Douglas Clark, as well as the upcoming Dynamite and Davy, the explosive lies of the British Bulldogs. He is author Stephen Bell. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to be here tonight. Excellent. And we, of course, are TN Tights, a great British wrestling podcast uh, for great British wrestling, as featured on Bodyslam.net, as brought to you by Powerful TV. I am your host, the great British attacker, Mr. Andrew Moore, and E2 Most. And I am joined, as always, by my co host, the pro wrestling t shirt champion of the world, Big Daddy Dan. How are you today? Very good, thank you. I've got some wonderful bargain t shirts during Black Friday. It's been quite good to me so yes i am very very well thank you and of course we have got stephen bell we are very much looking forward to this uh i think it's always nice when we can get somebody who has more knowledge of the the past of uh british wrestling uh you know we we, we go back as much as we can myself and Tam, but uh obviously we, we just missed the time frame, and uh, as much as I love to study it, much, much more than I have, it's something I haven't got around to. So uh, welcome to the show, Stephen. Yeah, thanks for having me, Andrew. Yeah, it's great to be here with my, uh, got my cup of tea, as instructed. <laughs> Excellent. And I'm loving your Hitman t-shirt. Yeah, it had to be. I thought, uh, I thought a, a Dynamite, I've got a Dynamite t-shirt, a Davy t-shirt. I thought that might be a little bit too on the nose for this, so uh, I, went, I went with the Hitman. That's all right. You've got the very subtle book cover picture behind you, so that's all. I good. have, yeah. Um, it's become an, an annual uh, an annual birthday present from my wife as my latest book cover uh, framed. So that's uh, a nice that present. An ideal backdrop. It's that's a beautiful a really uh, good backdrop. Present. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's. I'm sure it's going to be an excellent book. Uh, tell us about what uh, what were Dynamite and Davey watching when they were first first exposed to wrestling i guess well the first watching well um obviously it was kind of a golden era for british wrestling when they came onto the scene um there were only a few terrestrial tv channels uh, each tv channel had millions upon millions of viewers and in the 50s uh, itv put their weight behind uh, joint promotions and put British wrestling uh, at the forefront of their uh, exposure. And that lasted decades. It was uh, lucrative for everybody involved. It were a, a staple of particularly Saturday afternoon um, TV viewing. Tens, tens of millions of viewers up to at a time. And so uh, it were a cultural thing really. And whilst uh, Dynamite, uh, undoubtedly was more heading towards a boxing career at the time when he uh, by chance met Ted Bettley and uh, his career changed forever really and Davey followed suit so despite the fact that they were they initially viewed sort of down on the worked uh, aspect of it it was something that they quickly uh, quickly fell in love with um, because it it not only offered them the chance to be involved in a combat sport, which they loved and wanted to be involved with, but uh, it offered them the chance that this natural athletic ability towards uh, acrobatic and gymnastics dynamite, especially Tom was uh, such a natural, even at school with, um, with acrobatics and gymnastics that it sort of tied everything in all the aspects of the things that he were interested in as a, as a schoolboy, uh, And he just fell in love with it and it went from there. Because they both were involved with joint promotions when they trained as well, weren't they? They both appeared on World of Sport. Uh, they did, yeah. Uh, 75 Dynamite made his debut and 78 uh, David made his debut. So, yeah, both young teenagers still at school at the time. Uh, and sort of took took World of Sport by storm, really. They became the go-to um, tag team partners for Big Daddy. Big Daddy was the obviously the... Uh, the face of joint promotions, uh, but being <laughs> older and physically rotund, not the fittest man in the world, uh, and limited with his uh, working ability, he needed to be involved in tag team matches with uh, a fit young lad who would play the part of the underdog um, 
with the eel tag team sort of beating on him, just desperately trying to uh, make the make the hot tag to uh, to Big Daddy, who would come in do a few belly bumps and and claim the victory. And uh, being skinny little schoolboys, both Tom and Davy were ideal for that part, and that was that kind of gave them their break then, because it put them firmly as baby faces, this underdog uh, style, which they be, being smaller. Smaller boys, for want of a better word, teenagers in this big man's world. Um, it was just a natural thing, especially being on the side of Big Daddy. It was just a natural wave of fanfare that got behind them. And so when they launched singles careers, uh, they were halfway there, really, and um, quickly capitalised on that with uh, the brilliant performances. became so popular over here that they were destined for bigger things. See, that's something American fans, even to this day, can still never get their heads around, is how young wrestlers start out in the UK. And, I mean, even still to this day, many wrestlers are on the scene at the age of 14, 16. Yeah, well, it's the complete polar opposite of what it's, I suppose, it's like in America now, where the sort of... um, brought into it at such a young age they're all sort of trained within the same two or three wrestling schools I think now and I think that bears out in the final product where um they don't they don't seem to be the um sort of different styles that you'd have coming together um whereas the complete polar opposite of what it's like now was what we were like in Britain back then (laughs) they have the exposure almost straight away in front of millions and millions of viewers billions and millions of passionate fans um but yet they were on ten pound a night, you know. Uh, they were on a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of money. Uh, but yet they were getting towards being famous young men and young stars. And um, I think that grounding, uh, that exposure, uh, stood that stood them in good stead for the future. But they also had no sense of. Um, entitlement. They'd done it the hard way, you know. They'd been in the snake pit. They'd been they'd been stretched. They'd been worked. Uh, they knew what it was like. They were paying the dues, and by earning this tiny amount of money whilst being on the road away from the families at such a young age, it gave them a, a real grounding, and they never they never fell into any form of expectation of that uh, that wrestling owed them any kind of living. They knew they were going to have to work for everything that it was going to going to give them. And uh, don't forget, at, at that time, being not the next big daddy in terms of um, in terms of what they aspired to be as workers, certainly not. But it, it, that was almost the maximum realistic kind of uh, stardom that they could probably wish for at that time. They didn't know that in because of what happened in the early eighties with Vince McMahon and uh, obviously doing so well in Stampede Wrestling in Canada and the way that all knitted together. As it turned out, they ended up with. Uh, more riches and uh, such a more lucrative career than what they could ever dreamed of. They thought that they were going to be working so hard, working so hard for the careers, for their ability, uh, for the sport that they loved, just to earn a, a good working man's wage. I suppose it was just an alternative to be to to going down the mines, which is all that we had around here uh, back then. It was seen as the um, the better career for them at the time, but it certainly wasn't something that they were getting into just to be stars or just to be rich and famous. That was something that happened through their talent, the work ethic and uh, being in the right place at the right time in the early 80s with uh, with the wrestling. So in the right place at the right time, I'm assuming is the how they got to Canada. Um... Very much so. I mean, that's such a fascinating story. I've spoken to Bruce Hart at length about it. Um, it was Bruce that... Um, he, he just happened to be over here. He was uh, in his late twenties himself. Obviously, the eldest wrestling son of the of promoter Stuart uh, for Stampede Wrestling. Uh, the promotion was pretty much going nowhere around that time in 1977. Uh, he decided to come and do a tour of merry old England just uh, just to come and see the place. Really, a bit of a working holiday. Uh, aligned himself up with and because of Billy Robinson in the past and others uh, doing well, so well over there, nobody sort of realised that Stampede Wrestling was struggling, that um, many American territories 
and Canadian territories were struggling at that time. It was still seen as the land of milk and honey uh, over there to British wrestlers. So many of them approached him um, about getting him, him taking them back with him to be uh, to get involved with Stampede, but they weren't taking on at the time. They had no money to commit to taking on new talent. Uh, but when he happened to see Dynamite perform, he saw undoubtedly a future star. He saw somebody that he believed could turn their promotion around. So uh, he went home and told his dad all about him. His dad didn't believe that a um, 10 stone smaller teenager could possibly be a superstar and could possibly um, be that level of star in uh, a, in his Canadian promotion, which had generally been built around big men. Um, but eventually got to a point where it convinced him he had nothing left to lose. It looked like the it looked like Stampede were going to go into the doldrums. It uh, might have to show up at shop. So as a last chance alone, they flew dynamite over and yeah, the rest became history. It, it took over the territory. It became, uh, it, it turned that into one of the most successful territories uh, in the US and Canada and uh, became the star, the, the, the ultimate star, so much so that Davey followed suit a couple of years later and went and joined him. So that's when they started training at the Heart Dungeon. But let's go back to the the, the snake pit in Wigan because I guess, just for our American viewers, can you let them know what that was and even to this day are still running? <laughs> Yeah, it's still it is still a gym today, but it's more uh, uh, what you'd expect a gym today to be. It's not like it was uh, 40, 50 years ago. But the Snake Pit uh, was a notorious wrestling gym run by Billy Riley, and um, it trained. It was notorious for training shooters turned workers, so they were predominantly shooters. That's what they started off as. The fact that they were able to convert their skills into Worked contests made them all the more legitimate and all the more uh, feared and respected across the world. So uh, John Foley came from there, who ended up being a mentor to Dynamite, and uh, as I say, Billy Robinson, a whole host of um, British stars from the 50s, 60s, 70s, all trained at the Snake Pit, and they were all, as I say, notorious, um, tough guys. Uh, Ted Betley, had, uh, so, so that's in Wigan, whereas Ted Betley's gym was in Warrington. And so when a teenage schoolboy age, Tom met Ted and Ted invited him to his uh, gym in Warrington, he trained in a similar style, but involved a, a little bit more of the working aspect in terms of the uh, athleticism and the um, acrobatics and gymnastics, which suited Tom perfectly because he was so, uh, so adapt to all that. But what Ted did do was take him to the snake pit for to really, really toughen him up. And they just threw him in at the deep end, threw him in with the older lads who were there training purely as shooters at the time. Um, so they included sort of Wonderboy Steve Wright, who were also part of, part of Ted Betley's stable as well. And they, they stretched Tom, they worked him, but Ted insisted that no matter what, you know, you, you, you do not quit to these lads, you fight back, you always fight back. And that's what he did. And um, when he... Never, he never gave up once. He never asked for a timeout. He never, he never showed any sign of weakness when he were in there with these bigger, older, um, seemingly tougher uh, guys, lads a lot older than him. That's when uh, Ted knew that he had a, a, a real star in his hand who would f uh, fight for everything that he wanted from life and from wrestling. And uh, yeah, really became a father figure to him uh, and guided him all the way. Uh, but but yeah, the snake pits sort of become infamous. Off uh, it already was, but it's become even more famous after Dynamite and Davian since then. Since then, in Japan, because of Carl Gotch was another one, and and Billy Robinson, these uh, all time great guys in in Japanese culture. Uh, a large part of the way Japanese pro wrestling evolved uh, was seen to be down to the styles which had emanated from the snake pit and taken over there. In, through Carl Gotch and Billy Robinson. Carl Gotch stayed on, uh, lived in Japan most of his life uh, and became a, a trainer and promoter over there. And really the style was so uh, influenced by what they call the Wigan style, uh, which emanated from the snake pit. Of course, the catch as catch can style. Mm. So 
while over in Canada, um, is this the time they also started doing Japanese tours? Yeah, so um, New Japan at the time had a thriving um, junior heavyweight division and they, when word started to spread that Tom in sort of 1978 was really thriving and taking Stampede Wrestling by storm, um, they earmarked him as a future star for themselves, but there was work uh, visa issues and things like that. So uh, his, real, his real breakout for Japan came when uh, New Japan did a cross promotion with uh, some American territories and they did a tour of the American territories and they went through Stampede and they put their uh, WWF as it was because of the cross promotion with WWF as it was at the time. They put their WWF light heavyweight champion Tatsumi Fujinami uh, in with Dynamite in Stampede and they absolutely uh, tore the place down. The, the, the wrestled to a, a 20 minute time limit draw. Um, it, it, it's still much watched on YouTube today is that much I'll employ anybody to go watch it. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, so such hard eating, gripping action the whole way through. It's just relentless. Uh, and from that point on, New Japan knew that they had a star in Dynamite. So any any visa issues were quickly sorted out and he started doing regular lucrative tours for them. Uh, became uh, Quickly became... Um, uh, much needed part of their roster, uh, they would take him over there as much as, as much as they possibly could for uh, long tours, week long, weeks long, sometimes even months long uh, tours, and that's when he eventually in the early eighties, then a couple of years later, uh, kind of by chance, but they put Tiger Mask in with him when they gave uh, Satoru Sayama the gimmick of Tiger Mask. Uh, they knew that they needed somebody to. Um, wrestled the perfect match with him to really raise the profile of um, of Tiger Mask with the Sauras, the going to be the face of that light heavyweight division. So they put Dynamite in with him to get the best possible match out of Tiger Mask and the rest is history. They had one of the best uh, and most notorious rivalries, lasted many years, um, many fantastic matches. Dynamite was constantly putting Tiger Mask over, making him look as good as he possibly could. Um, but he became so uh, popular over there even though he was a guy who was predominantly a heel, uh, it became so popular over there because they, re the, they recognised this style, this Wigan style, they, they respected it so much that when um, when Tiger Mask uh, retired or went to some form of semi-retirement, uh, he then became, actually himself, became the face of that light heavyweight division and, and won the title himself. Also, they weren't the only guys that, because uh, Rollerball Rocco uh, was out there at 82 when he became yeah, Black he won Tiger. Yeah, he won much part of that scene uh, with Black Tiger when, when Dynamite won the um, Light of Weight Championship. Because, that was vacated because uh, Sayama Tiger Mask uh, had vacated the belt as part of his retirement. Uh, they had a 10-man round robin tournament. Uh, which involved Bret Hart, it involved both Dynamite and Davey, uh, the Cobra, and uh, yeah, Rollerball Rocco as Black Black Tiger was was one of those ten competitors. It were a real thriving division, and uh, yeah, Matt Rocco deserves a lot of credit for establishing it himself. Uh, did they actually ever face in WOS? Because uh, previously, before they became Tiger Mask, uh, he did do a tour in the UK. Yeah, they were actually, um, I mean, the, the paths only crossed um, very fleetingly because Tom was spending such little time over here. It was predominantly in Canada, secondary in Japan, and it were only when he would come over here to visit family a couple of times a year, it would pick up some spots for Max Crabtree and joint promotions. And uh, yeah, they were actually tag team partners. He were just wrestling as uh, Sammy Lee was... Sayama over here at the time had been, you know, done the usual rounds as Big, Dag Big Daddy's tag team partner and uh, done a lot of singles matches against Rollerball Rocco. Were really tearing the place down. The, it became really popular over here. And when um, when Tom came over for a tour, they were actually in a, a tag team action as partners against uh, Rollerball and uh, one other escapes my memory now, but. Uh, yeah, and Tom highlighted there and then. Wow, I would love to. I would love to work against this guy sometime. Uh, and 
in a matter of weeks or months later, it, it came, it done so well over here. It was part of his training. It were a Carl Gotch student, Wasatoro Sayama. It were a big part of his training. What to get him uh, over to Britain, spend some months here, learning that style to wrestle with the likes of Rocco. Uh, and then if he sort of passed that test, he were always going to go back and be a big part of the New Japan roster after he passed that test. So with such flying colours. And at that point, they had had the brainwave to uh, get the uh, sign up the Tiger Mask gimmick, which was uh, they had to buy that from uh, it was trademarked to a anime. It was a cartoon, comic book, um, of Japanese culture, really popular. So uh, they sort of had the brain brainwave to import it as a as a wrestling gimmick as well, just to try and capitalize on its popularity. And they realized that. Satoru Sayama was the perfect uh, person to, to put in that gimmick. And uh, as I say, then Dynamite was the perfect person to, to get the best out of him. Yeah, even to this day, NJPW Super Juniors, very much an anime come to life. Uh, they temp- typically push characters onto the juniors where heavyweights can typically just be themselves. Uh, some of the juniors uh, are, you know, masked or have, yeah, funny gimmicks, if you like. Yeah, yeah, that the the tiger mask, and then subsequently black tiger. Like, there's been numerous. Um, mm. Eddie Guerrero was black tiger for a short period of time as well. Uh, the black tiger gimmick was something. He, he was the nemesis of tiger mask in the anime series. Uh, so they quickly ball that up as well. And the sort of Tiger Mask and Black Tiger was the inception of this. As you say, it's still going on now. It's become a part of uh, particularly New Japan and their wrestling culture. Jushin Thunder Liger was another one that actually came yeah, directly from an much, anime yeah. to... Uh... Yeah, Sorry, Dan, go for it. <laughs> no, I was just going to comment on the fact that it's, it's still a big thing with the damn Japanese wrestlers coming over here to learn the British style. At the moment, we've mm. um, got... Shota Umino over here wrestling with Rev Pro and she's my brain has gone. Yotosuji. Thank you, Yotosuji, who uh, previously I really great enjoyed. Okan, uh... Yeah. Yeah, well that, that's because of the sort of Wigan style connection with the pure pure SO style in Japan, uh, and the Carl Gotch and Billy Robinson connection that were made back then. It's just something that's sort of stood the test of time it's so indelibly linked within the two styles that um and the connections have stayed there over all these years uh, that it's just part of the culture that they'll do talent swaps and talent trades and it's seen as part of the uh, apprenticeship if you like yeah. it's strange to think that uh in their time they were being criticized by the veterans for doing too much Similar to the way that the veterans are now, well, the veterans of our day are now criticizing the younger generation for again doing too much. It's quite funny how that works. Yeah, it, I think it's an evolution, you know, and I think wrestling's a, a cyclical business. It, it, it undoubtedly makes mistakes and it, it follows down routes that, you know, it's a bit like, um, I don't know, in, in real life smoking is one day seen as something fashionable and and then the next 10 years later anybody who smokes is criticized you know diesel cars <laughs> you know diesel cars everybody should buy a diesel car and then 10 years later uh, you you're borderline criminal for driving a diesel car uh, so yeah it's anything like it changes uh, it's cyclical i think it uh, appeals to different people at different times uh, people have to go and sort of seek out what what wrestling might suit them. It might not be the the thing that's most popular or shoved down the throat at that time. I think that's where, um, I think Vince McMahon was the person who almost brought that in. He brought in a, a style that became so popular to a certain demographic, but alienated some of the older wrestling fans at the time. Uh, and since then, I think wrestling promotions and wrestling companies have been uh, wrestling with themselves for their own identity and their own style, trying to offer a viable alternative. But, you know, it's difficult to always get it right. And and veterans at, at any one time are only as good as the veterans that have previously trained them at. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a very cyclical business. So you mentioned Vince McMahon there. Let's move on to um, how Dynamite and Davey ended up going to WWF. Yeah, well... Um, 
Dynamite didn't want to go to the WWF. He, he loved um, his Japanese tours. And at the time, Vince McMahon was very much, they had a, they had a deal with New Japan for a little bit of ta- talent sharing, but it was, it was mostly exposure for his own wrestlers to go over there. They paid him a lot of money for his wrestlers to go over there. Um, so it were a bit of a one-way street, really. Um, Dynamite loved being the big dog in the small pond of Stampede and bit loved being the one of the number one guys in, in, in New Japan. He didn't really see a need for, for that to change. Um, but Vince made him a couple of offers, which were refused one way or another. He did a couple of spot shows, weren't happy with his payoff, weren't happy with the way he was treated, weren't happy with the, with just being treated as, you know, going back to the bottom of the bottom of the ladder in a way. Uh, so we turned him down and it was only when there, uh, after the uh, New Japan brought them then together as a tag team, Dynamite and Davey, and that took the level of sort of legend over there as young stars to a whole new level. And Vince just decided then that he absolutely needed to uh, to have them. So he made them an offer they couldn't refuse. The... Um, the rumor is that when he finally convinced them and they agreed to sign, Vince got up and did a little, jumped on his desk and did a little jig of, of joy because uh, he'd finally got his men in particular at the time. I think he really wanted Tom. Tom had wrestled uh, Tiger Mask uh, very famously at Madison well, Square Garden right. for yeah. the WWF of Vince commentating. And that's when Dynamite had really made the strong impression on Vince, which were a few years earlier. And he'd spent that few years really trying to tie... Tom down. In the meantime, Davey had appeared on the scene and looked every bit as good as Tom. And when when he found out that they were first cousins, that were something obviously with kayfabe being so uh, ultimate at the time. Uh, they were in in Stampede. They were Tom was a heel. They were a babyface. They were feuding against each other. They kept any relationship, any family tie completely secret it was unknown to the rest of the wrestling world so uh, when Vince found out about that he he fell in love with them even more um, decided yeah you're absolutely going to be my future tag team champions made made them an offer that they couldn't refuse so they signed up but such was Tom's um, he had a he got a really strong business mind for the business as well he knew his own worth he was confident uh, to to go it alone at any time as was proven uh, many times throughout his career he um, he sort of held Vince to ransom a little bit and said, "I still want to keep my Japanese tours." So they did. They were the only um, WWF wrestlers at the time that were in charge of their own destiny in terms of Japan for a long period of time. They could go off and do their normal uh, New Japan tours off uh, at their own off their own back rather than being uh, sort of sent there by Vince on a bit of a promotional tour, a short, you know, four or five day promotional tour. They were still going on three week tours, lucrative tours. Um, and uh, But yeah, they were prob- predominantly uh, with the WWF then. And then suddenly uh, when 1985 turned into 1986 giant, uh, sorry, they'd gone to, uh, yeah, they'd, sorry, they'd signed for New Japan, then they'd jumped to, New, uh, to All Japan uh, and Giant Baba in 1986, didn't renew their um, contracts and that wall. The, the conspiracy theory is that Vince McMahon had said to him, look, these guys are going to be tag team champions come WrestleMania 2. They're going to be headliners. They're going to be touring far and wide. I'm going to be paying them money that you can't compete with. Um, basically, don't don't bother. Um, so that brought an end to the Japanese tour, which, you know, absence making the art grow fonder. When they did go back a few years later after leaving the WWF, uh, their legend had grown even more and they were just so uh, the Japanese fans were so glad to have them back uh, and yeah they just became uh, indelibly linked with Japanese culture Japanese wrestling and they still are one of the top sort of maybe 10 all-time guys in so where did Matilda come from Matilda, well, I'm not sure where she came from, but uh, Davey took her home to be uh, their family pet. He, he, she was sourced by the WWF um, to be, you know, obviously we're in an era where you had um, Coco Beware, uh, Ricky Ricky Steamboat had his, it weren't a dragon, what were it? Uh, um, some kind Is of... It, yeah, uh, yeah it were, um, 
Yeah, some, or Komodo, some kind of some kind of iguana, wasn't it? Or, Komodo uh, dragon, uh, maybe. And you'd got um, who else? Did you, obviously, Jake the Snake. Uh, they were appealing to a certain audience, a younger audience, and they wanted the babyface to have sort of mascots and the British Bulldogs being the British Bulldogs, <laughs> it was quite a natural thought that they would get them a British Bulldog. So uh, she was sourced by the WWF, but uh, all those guys that had these mascots, it became their responsibility to travel with them, to own them, to feed them. Uh, it became part of their, they became part of their sort of traveling luggage, if you like. And uh, Davey was more, took more of a shine to Matilda than Tom. Uh, Tom, Tom initially viewed Matilda as uh, a little bit of a burden, I think. Uh, but Davy, so Davy took her in and took her home, and she became a Smith family pet whenever they were home off the road. But yeah, I mean, it weren't exactly a, an ideal life for any of them pets uh, living the WWF lifestyle at the time. I've heard that the um, the the figures set that you can buy of the bulldogs with Matilda is actually worth a huge amount of money now in good condition. Yeah, well, the the ones uh, produced at the time, it was such a short period between those uh, figures again. By the time it had been firmly aimed at children and a younger audience, when they started producing figures, it was such a short period of time where they were actually still the British Bulldogs and they had Matilda. Uh, that such a limited number of these things out there that they are. And people try and produce repl replicas, but they're not, they're never the same and never worth the same. So, yeah, they are such limited in supply now that they are worth a lot of money. So, as you say, they're kind of taking off. But what was happening to the UK scene at home? Because we're drawing into the period of the dark time of UK wrestling. Very much so. So, the rug had been pulled under Brit from under British wrestling at the time. Uh, the they had zero contingency plans for after Big Daddy. They, they, um, that, that was forcing them to lose a lot of the big stars like Dynamite and David Roll, but Rocco was doing most of his stuff in, uh, a lot of his stuff in Japan at that time. Chick Cullen had, were also in Stampede then. Um, they had such, William Regal was not long for this world, long for British wrestling. Uh, they've got such an array of young talent, but they never... Um, invested in them you know they, they live so long off big daddy and giant a stacks uh, that yeah fit finley's and stephen regals and and these were always viewed as uh, the undercard and it's difficult then when they needed to make them uh, the main event to 10 million people it was difficult to make that instant transition they weren't able to do it there were the tragedy with mal kirk who's from my her hometown village of featherston he, he he died in the ring after a big splash from big daddy that uh, was that were 1987 and that were treated as a bit of an expose uh, by the media uh, and then Greg Dyke I think Greg Dyke wasn't it took over ITV it was. uh, wasn't a fan of wrestling sorry as bad, the bad publicity that were going off at the time um, I think Tony Banger Walsh should released a bit of an expose as well that had made front page uh, in the news of the world it was it was just the beginnings of a real dark time uh, and when the uh, television deal was taken off them, they got taken off terrestrial TV, um, the regular spot taken away. It, it just sort of, it was very, very slow death from there. So by the time it got to the early 90s, it dropped perfectly into Vince McMahon's hands where it got this lucrative market that were wide open looking, uh, that needed a new form of wrestling to be piped into uh TV sets, Sky TV had signed up the big deal to, to air it on British TV. All homes now were starting to have the likes of, the likes of Sky TV. Uh, and the next thing, this alternative, well, produced and aiming at young kids. And they had got, by that point, Dynamite were kind of off the scene. He were wrestling back in the UK, a um, bit of a shadow of his former self. Um, and the UK scene by then was just, you know, in front of dozens you know, hundreds if it were lucky, but generally dozens of people in small, smoky halls. Uh, the Dynamite Kid, or a shadow is for myself, a red line in, but against the likes of Fit Finley, but uh, it, it, the promotions were just 
almost non-existent. They were tra- treated almost as a tribute show to to the WWF. You know, they'd got a, a fake Undertaker, a fake Legion of Doom, and all that, and it kind of became a bit of a mockery, especially for you like Tom, who, who treats so seriously, took such pride in his art um, that it would just become a means to an end. It the only thing he knew, his body were no longer fit enough to really be wrestling at any kind of standard, but it was the only thing that he knew. He was still taking a lot of pride in what he was doing, but it was difficult for him. He were on such a small amount of money again. He'd gone back to where it came from. In the meantime, Davey was um, the British Bulldog at that point, you know, singular, and uh, was being hailed as the sort of Hulk Hogan, British the British version of Hulk Hogan, absolute superstar. Uh, every time they did a UK tour, he was all over the media, all over the press, uh, on talk shows and game shows. And so, yeah, the the, the careers, well, the real fork in the road with the careers yeah. when um, David became the superstar and Tom went back to where it began, uh, wrestling in these small, smoky halls on not much more money than Max Crabtree had been paying him 15 years earlier. Now, there is a petition going around at the moment uh, to get Davy Boy Smith a star on the Wigan Walk of Fame. And we've talked about it briefly you know, a few times. There's something that, you know, without the Bulldog having his success at the time, probably British Wrestling would have probably just died completely because at least new trainees still had something to aspire for he yes. was he was being you know guys like my, myself and Dan watched the Bulldog because he was British yeah yeah absolutely I would say I'm, a, I'm, I'm of that I'm of that age I was a prime um, Vince McMahon target with that I was sort of you know I'd have been seven year old in some of Slam 92 or on you know absolute peak uh, fandom era for what you were after so yeah and the a lot of them have spoke out about it uh Wade Barrett was, Davy Boy was his hero. Um, Seamus, Drew McIntyre have all spoken about the fact that the British Bulldog and uh, Davy being in that position that he were in at the time, uh, especially, you know, sort of waving the Union Jack and really bringing it home, his thick accent coming across, mm. uh, really rammed it home to him that it could be done. It wasn't just for these jacked up Americans who were sort of larger than life, uh, it, it was something that was achievable. There's no doubt that uh, that next wave of stars, there's so many British stars came uh, and headlined all over the world. We're still seeing them now. Uh, and yeah, Davey was the real link that held that together through that through that dark period. Uh, now, Dynamite has unfortunately got hit with a bit of a stigma that many other wrestlers who have gone on to great things uh, who've done very much similar. Do you think this is kind of unfair considering what we know about a lot of the top stars past and, you know, pa- uh, yeah, past Dave, uh, his time as well? People like Steve Austin. Yeah, um, I think I think it's got a lot to do with his relationship with the WWF, uh, I really do, or the WWE, obviously, as it was now, and Vince McMahon's empire, it's so powerful, it was at the time, still is now. Um, they've got a definite ability to, um, I don't want to use the word whitewash, but sort of, you know, tell a, tell the story from a certain perspective, <laughs> let's say. Um, and, yeah, if you're, if you're firmly under that umbrella, then you will be um, trekked with that brush, if you like. You'll be painted with that brush. Um, and as you say, there's, uh, it, it was far, far, far from perfect. Um, I, I've become good friends with his daughter, Bronwyn, through this process. Uh, she, she's a really wonderful uh, lady, and she's so uh, in, in tune with, with who Tom was. She doesn't feel a need for him to have the the sort of WWF uh, shine put over him. You know, she doesn't. Um, while it'd be wonderful, and there's no doubt that he should be in the Hall of Fame. You know, it's no coincidence mm. that yeah. this guy who's viewed undoubtedly as one of the top five uh, talents of all time in terms of his ability and his influence 
you know, you look at the people who are in the Hall of Fame, you know, the, the, I think the WF try and hide behind the fact that his stint with them was so short, that, but, but people get put in the WF Hall of Fame who never wrestled in a WF ring. So, you know, that argument goes straight out of the window. It's no coincidence that, as you say, he's never sort of had that um, glossing over uh, and he's not in the Hall of Fame. That had to do with his relationship with the WWF. It did end under a big cloud and he refused to go back. He's one of the few that Vince McMahon did offer him to go back, did want him to go back, uh, asked him to go back. Davey did. Dynamite told him where to go. Uh, and they never spoke again or they didn't speak until many, many years later when Tom were already in a wheelchair uh, and he made a one-off sort of appearance backstage. Um, he... He was one of the very, very few, the only one that I can think of off the top of my head that sort of had the last say with Vince McMahon, if you like. He, he he went on his terms. There were no money could bring him back. No offer could bring him back. Uh, and I think that's got a lot to do with it. I, he's never sort of qualified for that WWF treatment, if you like, uh, of how things are presented, which has only left um, the sort of grisly side for a long time to be told. Uh because the nature of the human race is that we'll always sort of gravitate towards the, the sort of scandal side. It's something I've not tried to do with this book. It's all in there, yeah. or as much as I saw necessary series in there. But what I've done is apply all the necessary context, uh, something that's never done before. You know, everybody treats these incidents that you're involved with or that David were involved with, and they'll just, you, they just know of the incident. They don't understand the timeline what was going on at the time, the other context, what was going off at the time. And that's what I've really, really tried to work on. So rather than ignore these things, rather than ignore these um, potential um, controversies, what I wanted to do were include them, not dwell on them, not um, sensationalise them, but um, let the reader know where that came in the timeline, what else were going on, what pressures they were under, what physical pain they were under, what emotional pain they were in at the time, because they had so much going on in their lives, both together and individually. So yeah, it's something that I certainly didn't want to sweep under carpet. I don't think this book would um, make it very far if all them things were swept under carpet. Uh, they're absolutely in there, yeah. but they are treated with the right level of respect and context. Uh, and there's no doubt that I put, I try, I try and put wherever possible, I've put as much of a positive spin on everything as I can. They both had such redeeming qualities that they should undoubtedly both be in the Hall of Fame. They should undoubtedly both be um, remembered really well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as you've worded the question, Tom has never quite had that um, as you say, you, you mentioned the Steve Austin thing. The wrestling at the time was full of that kind of um, scandal. You know, the the nature of the time, it maybe came a little bit before Austin's time, but predominantly in Dynamite and Davis' time, it was a business of excess. There were no um, sort of limits put on what excess. There, there were these young kids who never dreamed they would earn that sort of money. Suddenly launched into this, um, world where they had as much money as they could spend. Uh, there was steroids just flying around. Uh, the drink culture, as these as these eras, which had come from the seventies um, into the eighties, and the money exploded. These vices and these excesses exploded with them, and it was sort of unmonitored. It was brand new and. Um, obviously as we went into the 2000s, into the new millennium and with the tragedies that continue to happen, uh, culminating with Benoit, I think is the actual sort of mm -hmm. peak, if you like, of it all. Something had to happen then and they brought in all the wellness policies and everything like that and drug testing finally, even though they'd claimed they'd done that many years before. But it was just the nature of what they were living in at the time. Uh, very few of them were squeaky clean. Uh, but... Yeah, most of them had a, a relationship with the WWF to sort of polish their stories up a little bit and Dynamite never quite had that. Yeah, because uh, Davey himself has only just been admitted to the Hall of Fame. So was there any real reason behind his delay? I, I don't know. You see, Davey's story, again, it's not something that, again, I've hid away, but Davey's story sort of didn't end well you know he had such a fantastic career and such a popular man you know uh 
where Dynamite was viewed. You know, I've tried to sort of let the reader make their own mind up because the the bully tag is something that Dynamite gets uh, put on him quite a lot. Many people strongly deny that, um, but many people strongly uh, say that it was. So, you know, that's I think it's a little bit subjective, is that, you know, I, I dare say some of the people that were victims of his sort of antics would say, oh, of course he were a bully, people who were his friend, who he stuck up for, he was such a loyal person, like fiercely loyal. They can't ever dream that he were a bully because he was he was their protector, or many of his loyal friends protectors. Um, whereas uh, Davy was sort of just really liked by everybody, genuinely loved by everybody, uh, such a popular person. But between the Montreal screw job, um, his relationship with the art family sort of broke down uh, his relationship with uh, steroids and drugs and his death at 39 of an heart attack at that time. I don't know this. I don't know that that's what sort of put a, a bit of a separation with his relationship with the WWF because for so many years, 20 years, it was such a glaring omission from the Hall of Fame, given what he achieved, uh, how, how really fantastic a worker he was, uh, loved by everybody. Uh, I, as we've discussed, had this real impact on British wrestling and forged the WWF's popularity in Europe, particularly in Britain. It was an absolute pillar of the Hall of Fame. It should have been. Yeah, it took 20 years to um, to get him in there. I don't know. I, I, I suspect that it were the controversies around the final few years of his life and things like that that probably just made, uh, made the WWF and Vince maybe a little bit hesitant. But um, no, he, he, he always absolutely deserved to be in there and stuck his rightful place in there now. Definitely. Yeah. It's been a shame to see um, his son get released recently um, with only having... One dark, was it one dark match that, um, yeah, 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 again, ridiculous. I'm desperately hoping he ends up, um, rejoining his tag team with Lance Archer and, um, getting well, yeah, he, um, I think he's been a victim of circumstances as well with COVID because I think the, um, the plan was firmly in place. I'm led to believe that he would come over and be a main event with NXT UK, uh, wrestling the likes of Walter, um. Which you know could have been fantastic <laughs> matches there. It would have you you would have thought that that would have really exploded NXT UK. Um, but when travel restrictions came in, I think that sort of put an end to that. And then any momentum around him re-signing was sort of taken away. And oh, was the, the WWE, WWE at the minute with the way that the release talent is just notorious, isn't it? Nobody's safe. It doesn't matter what your name is, what you've achieved. It seems. Um, Nobody's sort of saved from that. So uh, with what they had planned for him being shelved, yeah, he ended up being a victim of circumstance, I think. Yeah. Have you got to see uh, the Billingtons, uh, Tom and Mark, wrestle uh, at all? Yes, uh, I've, I've, met, I've met them actually, and uh, I'm in regular contact with the dad, dad Mark, Tom's brother. Yeah, I mean, it's so odd. I mean, the, the name Thomas and Mark, Thomas obviously after Tom and Mark after his dad, Mark, and um, Tom, Thomas, is such a doppelganger for... Um, Henslow, lad. Yeah, but he's, he is literally Tom's doppelganger, yeah, and he's, yeah. he's owned his style undoubtedly on his, his uncle who he reveres so much. To see him in the ring, it, it is eerie, mm. really, it is. And uh, obviously, he's... Uh, his younger brother, a couple of years younger, exactly like Dave, were a couple of years younger than Tom, slightly taller, slightly leaner, and um, with the darker, darker, bushy, wavy hair. From a distance, when the when they're together, it, it could they are literally the sort of next generation of the Bulldogs. It's uh, it's quite eerie to see, actually. It's fantastic to see as well, because just uh, to have that lineage continue, and they've signed. Uh, a deal to go over and wrestling for uh, uh, indie promoter in 
Western Canada in Calgary. So they're actually going to be going. They're actually going to be going over and uh, wrestling in Calgary as well. So uh, yeah, it's it's really following in the in the footsteps. And it, I, I mention it. I do mention it in the book that they're sort of um, keeping the legacy going. I don't think Dynamite or Davy or the Bulldogs legacy is in any doubt whatsoever. But um, Thomas and Mark are the sort of epitome of it at the minute, I think. That's, uh, I've seen them a you few mentioned... times now on stream. Do, um... Go for it, Dan. Mm. Yeah, I've seen them live a couple of times. It's brilliant. Um, you mentioned that you've spoken to um, Mark Billington. Um, who else are you speaking to for the book? Uh, so I've worked very closely with Bronwyn, as I've said. Um, I've been in quite regular contact with Mark. Um, the closest ally of everybody, as well as Bronwyn, uh, has been Ross Hart. So what happened was well, I, I got in touch with Bruce Hart. I had a sort of three or four hour chat with him. That, that went really great. Um, off the back of that, Ross Hart found out about the project and he actually reached out to me. You know, I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to speak to you. I'd like to contribute. So absolutely, we're over the moon with that. Uh, obviously, Ross is um, not only a key member of the art family, but he's actually classed as the stampede historian and as a wrestling historian himself. I knew that he was going to be such a, an important source of information. Well, it went above and beyond that. Um, we built up a, a really close relationship. We're in contact weekly. Um, I could just ask him anything. He would give me a really in-depth answer. Um, and it sort of went on and on from there to the point where he, I asked him to write a foreword. You know, he was so, uh, I, I thought he deserved to have his name on the front of the book, to be honest, he'd contributed so much. And so um, he's written a wonderful foreword, really sort of putting me over, putting the book over as a, a, a needed project that um, is balanced in its views and uh, honorable. And yeah, it, it really speaks highly of it. Um, and a bit emotional actually reading his forward when he sent me it. Well, it were a fantastic, it, it were an honor, it really was. Uh, and I'm, I'm really, really pleased and uh, proud of, of our relationship, really. And to be he's so passionate about Tom and Davey, about the whole subject altogether. Obviously, the, the became family uh, is so passionate about how he wants them to be remembered. You know, it, he's one of these, he doesn't believe that the uh, negative stuff should be just in the way but as soon as I put it to him that I wanted to apply these layers of context and I think he just shared that vision of how it should be done and it, I sent him I sent him sort of one of the first drafts of the complete manuscript and I, t I told him specifically only agree to write the forward if you if you're happy with this you know I don't want you to sort of put your name something you're not happy with and straight away he came back with a resounding um that he wore over at the moon with it. And we worked hard, we worked hard to tweak it in certain areas and try and keep various family members happy or might not, you know, we really had to balance everything. There were a lot to take into account. Um, but yeah, when he came back, said that he was really happy with it and so happy that he wrote a long forward. It, it really meant a lot to me. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I've, uh, I've spoken to Keith Hart as well. He gave me a wonderful anecdote. Uh, I only really spoke to him about one particular story that uh, Dynamite includes a version of it in his book, but it gets it gets the time, the place, and the people involved mixed up. He must have he must have not remembered it right. So when I asked Ross about it, he said, "Nah." He says, "No, nah, I know that Tom got that wrong in his book." Keith's the person to ask. Um, he was he it were him that were there, not Brett. Um, Tom had written that it was Brett that were involved. Um, so. I reached out to Keith and he sent me a wonderful version of the anecdote. And it's one of the, one of the many, many parts of the book that I'm really proud of because it's sort of an exclusive. It's people will, people who've read Tom's book will know something about it. We're just a couple of paragraphs long, but as I say, his memory must've failed him on that one. He'd got it sort of a bit easy. So to deliver a couple of sort of pages of solid, it, it's, it's funny. And it, it's not only funny, it, it really forges his relationship with Ali Race, which went on to be such a key part of part of his life and his influence. So it's so, such an important part of the book. I was really proud to get that off Keith. Um, I've spoken to Brett indirectly. Brett, uh, I reached out to Brett through Bromwyn. He asked me to write him uh, 
a breakdown, a bit of a letter and a breakdown of what the project were about, where I wanted to go with it, uh, and what anecdotes what anecdotes and what quotes, direct quotes I wanted to use from his book. Um, so I sent him a full list of that and it sort of introduced myself and the project. Uh, it got back to me saying, well, you send me the same thing again, but with a firm um, area for me to sign and date it. He says, I really, it, it sent the message back to me through Bronwyn that he really liked the sound of the project and believed me, intentions were good. And so he sent me a signed version of it back saying, yeah, crack on, use, use as much as you want. And then, uh, yeah, I've spoken to Michelle indirectly. Um, Diana as well, I've spoken to. So yeah, very, quite a lot of members of the family and their various friends, including uh, Scott McGee, Gary Ports, who um, is actually from up the road from me originally, but he wrestled in the US and Canada and became a real, real good friend of, of Tom's. Uh, he's given me a great, uh, a couple of great anecdotes and a really good tribute to Tom. Uh, Chick Cullen, um, I've been sort of in, in bits of contact with uh, there and everywhere and a couple of other British wrestling historians, Darren Ward and Tony Earnshaw, they've helped me out and um, American wrestling historian, podcast host Dave Dynasty. So yeah, a, a full sort of suite of resources I ended up with, no matter what question I'd got next, I'd got somewhere to turn, be it a Davey's family, Tom's family, uh, an art member or a British historian or an American wrestling historian. I felt like I'd got somebody to turn every way so I could make it as uh, in-depth as, as I felt it needed to be. Now, before we get you to talk, uh, give us, uh, tell us what your other books were previously about, what gave you the inspiration to write the Davy and uh, Dynamite story? Well, it's something that uh, it, it can organically uh, I've, I've always been a passionate sports fan a passionate um sort of true life documentary watcher and true life sort of book reader autobiography reader and um i remember when i when i got back into wrestling uh sort of in the attitude era I got into it, and me and brother got back into it in a big way, and we sort of wanted to catch up on everything that we'd missed out on in the sort of five years that it had been since we'd sort of left the Hulk Hogan era. Um, so what, one of his friends that hadn't been through that, he'd just stayed a fan the whole way through, so much so that he were, became a bit of a curator of the old VHS tapes. So because we wanted to catch up on everything that we'd missed and more, we got everything off him. So we got all the pay-per-views going all about way back to WrestleMania 1. So I just remembered Davy. I just remembered the British Bulldog. So when we got to WrestleMania two, and then the Survivor Series that followed, and WrestleMania three, um, there were the British Bulldogs. Now I thought completely wrongly. I thought, oh, they've just needed somebody to make the British Bulldogs up with the British Bulldog. That's the British Bulldog. That's the one I know. So I thought that. Tom was almost the sidekick in a way when I saw this as a sort of 15, 16 year old. Uh, and so it were only when I read Mick Foley's book, he started talking about Tom as being this all time great. Uh, I thought, oh, I got that completely wrong. I'll have to go back and watch some more. So I did a little bit of research on Tom as sort of a 16, 17 year old then. Uh, found out that he'd got this sort of really amazing story, dramatic story and found out about um, Dave, him and David being first cousins. So this is going back 20 years now. Uh, I found out that they were from a very similar heritage to me, only less than an hour's drive away from me, uh, from a small mining town just like me. And I sort of just became uh, really passionate about their story, really. I thought it was this wonderful story. And then a few years later, when Brett's book came out, that sort of really put a lot more meat on the bones, really got me hooked on their story, started finding out about what they'd achieved in Japan. And so it, it sort of happened organically over many, many years. And then in the meantime, I'll sort of preempt your next question as you've just said it, if it's all right, and yeah, tell you how I'm sort of an author. Uh, I went to Brazil in 2014 for the World Cup. We're in Brazil for six weeks, um, following the, the 2014 World Cup. And um, I mean, England were only there for two weeks, but I was there for six. Uh, and when I came back, I'd, met, I'd sort of fallen in love with Brazilian football. I'd, got, I'd met a really close friend uh, who was fanatical about Brazilian football. So we stayed in touch. And then 
couple of years down the line. In fact, it was five years ago, almost to the day now, uh, a small town Brazilian football team had gone on this remarkable Roy of the Rovers type story, made it all the way to the South American equivalent of the Europa League final um, after a decade of promotion after promotion that had gone from playing in front of just dozens of people on dusty parks to being uh, superstars, just organically, this wonderful sporting story. And their plane crashed on the way to, to this biggest match of their lives and almost all of them died. Uh, over 70 people died in that crash. A bit like I'd done with Dynamite and Davis story, I got really hooked on that. And I, my friend Sergio was sending me translated news stories. He was sending me translated, um, he was adding English subtitles onto Brazilian news reports. So I accidentally sort of became a little bit of an expert on that story. I was so hooked on it and it just sort of disappeared off our media straight away, which I thought was very unfair given the scale of the tragedy. And it were only when what had never been covered at all in the British media was the sporting story that had gone behind it, this decades long sport, a decade long sporting story where they'd just achieved so much. I'd always been pretty good at writing and telling stories. So I just decided to achieve a dream I'd long spoke about eventually writing a book one day. And I thought, well, if I don't do it about this, I might as well shut up about it because I'll never do it about anything. <laughs> So uh, I just decided to start. I got halfway through it, didn't really know where I read in with it, sent it off to um, Pitch Publishing, who are the UK's biggest sports book publisher. And they loved it and said, yeah, go for it. We'll, we'll do it for you. So uh, it, it did really well. It was fantastically well received. And I sort of built this relationship up with um, the publisher. I also, in the meantime, knew about the story of Douglas Clark. Douglas Clark, I live in Huddersfield now. He's a local hero, uh, undeniable war hero, like saved so many lives in the most dramatic way. Have you seen the film Hacksaw Ridge? He, he was he was kind of a real life Hacksaw Ridge, British version of Hacksaw Ridge. Um, but he was a pioneer of British rugby league, uh, England, um, Great British Lions, superstar, one of the best players of all time at rugby league. Uh, his war injuries were so chronic that he got told, he got a 20% disability certificate, got given a pension or offered a pension uh, from the services, uh, but told that he could never do anything strenuous again. He certainly couldn't be a professional sportsman. Uh, he sat at home board, decided, no, I can't do that. I'm going to go and have another go at rugby. Had a second Hall of Fame career, won everything all over again, was England's best player all over again. Uh, when he finally hung his rugby boots up, uh, I was also a um, exponent of Cumberland and Westmoreland grappling uh, and a, a champion at that, a world champion at that. So when he hung up his wrestling boots and hung up his Cumberland and Westmoreland wrestling, the, it was timed it perfectly that... All in wrestling, professional wrestling, did at the Shaws in 1930, and he became a professional wrestler and became a world champion professional wrestler. Um, so yeah, he had some life. So I already knew about that, and I'd got pitch publishing telling me that I could write another book. So I wrote his biography. Um, in the meantime, I'd sort of started flirting mentally with the idea of doing the Bulldogs. I'd got this idea growing organically in my mind, but I didn't feel like I was qualified at that stage to do it, but it's called The Man of All Talents, The Extraordinary Life of Douglas Clark. It made um, front page British tabloid news because it, it got really popular at the time of Remembrance Day and many British papers, Daily Mirror and, well, the old Mirror group ran with it as a as their Remembrance Day story uh, with extracts from the book. And yeah, it was so, so well received. Uh, I received so much positive feedback, but by at that point I thought to myself, well, I am in, now in a position to do Dynamite and Davy, so uh, I cracked on with it sort of just over a year ago now when I really started putting pen to paper. I'd already got sort of real background research in, started reaching out to family members and friends, and yeah, 12 months later, it's uh, it's getting, it's currently being formally edited by the publisher, and here we are. Very yeah. excited for it. <laughs> yes, same as. Uh, anything else, Daniel? Um, no, I mean, I was, I was going to mention, we did previously speak um, with Andrew, um, Andy Scott, Andy Scott, um, who wrote the biography of Chick Cookie Knight, 
Um, oh yeah. Who, yeah. Um, so around about the same time as um, W. Clark. I have got a I've spoke to Andy. I spoke to Andy quite a lot myself. I did a little bit of cross promotion and yeah. Yeah. Because they, they wrestled each other. It's it's funny because we'd we'd already spoke had me and Andy um, as books came out at a similar time as you say. We sent each other a copy. Did a little bit of cross promotion. Um, and the there were one picture that I found. I went to meet Douglas Clark's um, niece, last surviving sort of close relative, his niece, and she'd got loads, and she's like the curator of all his stuff, and she donated a lot of his stuff to the um, Imperial War Museum. I went to Imperial War Museum and had a session there with all Dougie's war diaries. Really sensational experience. Stumbled across this photo of him wrestling, uh, well, a few, really crisp, for say it's in the 1930s, but I didn't know who we were against on many of them. Some of them I did, some of them I didn't. Uh, but I included them in the book, these fantastic black and white grainy images, but really crisp, fantastic. Uh, and literally a couple of days after I'd been conversing with Andy and sent him the picture, uh, I sent him the book. He got back in touch with me and it were actually Chick Cocky Knight that wore one of the one of the guys that Douglas Clark were wrestling, who I had no oh. idea who he told me that. So yeah. That's brilliant. Love it. Yeah. There we go. Connection through wrestling. Uh, now, before we have you go, uh, we ask all our guests this, and uh, seeing if you've got a bit of a, a nice historian background, we're going to say that you can't have Davy and Dynamite. Right. Who would you put on a Mount Rushton of British wrestling? Maybe two that influenced them, and then two that they influenced if you like. Well, yeah, um, I would certainly think of that straight away. The first one that comes into my mind is the Hitman. Um, such a, I'm such a Bret Hart mark. Um, but what I'd like to include in this, it's not just um, the wrestling ability of which he, he is one of the greatest ever, undoubtedly, but it's also, I think, I want to include people who are, I think were good for the business and reflect the business in, in the right way. And I, I just think Brett did that so much. He just seems to be this man who was um, on the right side of everything the whole time. You know, he's, he's he had so many controversies in his life, but he's almost always on the right side. And I think time has proven that more and more. Uh, so, so Brett, that's the first one on there for me. The second one, in a similar fashion, is Mick Foley. Mick, I, I've spoken to Mick as well, um, just by a, a, some oh, sorry, uh, direct messaging. When um, we say Mount Rushton, we're looking for a British one, you see, because everyone talks about uh, Bret well, Hart. Well, I was going to go there, right? Okay, well, uh, I was going to go there with the, the other two, actually. Okay, so there we That's go. That's all right. Yeah. Um, just to talk about Mick, so I've spoken to Mick on this. Again, such a fantastically nice guy. Um, and, yeah, such a positive influence on everybody that were around him and Dynamite and Davey influenced him so much. There's a really sorry story about how he was broken in in a very harsh way, particularly by Dynamite. That's yes, that's heavily fe- that's heavily featured <laughs> in the book. Um, but Mick being Mick sort of moved on from that, used it as a learning tool, didn't hold any animosity against them whatsoever. Uh, he's Dynamite's on Mick's Mount Rushmore. Um, they went on to have a good relationship in Japan, wrestled again in Japan, uh, and Mick and David became really, really good friends in the mid to late nineties when they were both with the WWF. Uh, so he, he were a really strong influence. Uh, in terms of British wrestling, the other two spaces on the Mount Rushmore are undoubtedly going to go to Billy Robinson. There would be no uh, pro- professional wrestling wouldn't exist as we know. I don't think without Billy Robinson, Dynamite and David wouldn't exist as they did without Billy Robinson. Uh, Stampede Wrestling, he'd done what Dynamite did for Stampede Wrestling 10 years earlier, sort of being one of the headliners, the best British import. He'd done what Dynamite and David, particularly Dynamite, did in Japan uh, by being this notorious guy, Jin. Uh, it really, his, his career really inf- um, mirrored Dynamite, I think, in particular, but sort of 10 to 20 years earlier. Uh, they achieved a very similar level of notoriety in the same place as Britain, Canada and Japan and the US. Uh, and his style, this shooter style, really influenced Tom as well. So he was undoubtedly got to be on there. And the other one we've talked about, I think, is so underrated, doesn't get anywhere near the credit it deserves. And that's Rollerball Rocco. Um, some of his, some of Dynamite, and even Davies, but particularly Dynamite, some of his best 
uh, matches in a British ring. All his best matches, really, were against Rollball Rocco. Uh, the match where Bruce Hart saw Dynamite and eyed him up as this next big thing was a sensational match with the Rollball Rocco. Uh, it was as Black Tiger, as we've discussed, uh, in so many of the so much of the year ingrained in that era that involved Dynamite and Tiger Mask. Uh, and, but he doesn't get anywhere near the credit, probably because he didn't ever make it or didn't ever bother to sort of go over and play his trade in the US and Canada. Uh, he's just not sort of spoken in the same breath and he, he really should be. Uh, he, had, he had that that explosive talent that we see now and we take for granted now, but he had it when it weren't when it weren't sort of ten a penny. It was yeah. well, few and far between that had that level of um, realism, explosive talent, eye flying, acrobatic, and you know just sort of non-stop action style. Uh, so yeah, that'd be my four, given the stipulations. If that's all right. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. <gasps> Uh, how do you feel? Because right now, British wrestling and especially on a world world scale, there's so many British stars now across the world. How do you see that? Well, I undoubtedly see that as the influence of, I think, David particularly. But what I do notice is um, on social media, a lot of them are starting to talk about dynamite. I don't know if that's just because of the... Um, sort of social media bubble that I've evolved for myself with all this. But certainly a lot of the big stars now, I noticed Anthony Agogo, one of the latest ones. Uh, I've noticed um, who's the extra league player, Ridge Holland uh, has done it as well. A lot of these lads have really started talking about Dynamite and mentioning Dynamite as a strong influence, which it seemed to go years and years where that didn't seem to be a, a thing. Um, it, it seemed to be sort of a a ghost of wrestlers past had, had been dynamite, you know, with a lot of talk about Davy still, but uh, it was as if dynamite for various reasons had almost been swept under carpet. But uh, I think that I think that's gone now, and I'm really pleased to see it. I think they're all acknowledging his influence on on the business, acknowledging his influence on them, uh, and viewing him once again as this. So a standard bearer that he should be, he should be classed as and was for so long, and then sort of not sort of almost forgotten about. I don't know if that was because of the controversies, or just because um, he hadn't transcended the golden era into the attitude era. He hadn't transcended that uh, popularity like a lot of them had. I'm not sure. Maybe a, bit, a combination of both. Whereas it seems now, as they've become more students of the historic game. His name seems to be coming up an awful lot, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see it. I'd say between him and Davey, uh, about 75% of our guests always have either him or Davey on the Mount Rushton of British yeah. Wrestling. And uh, it's just fantastic. Sorry, Daniel. No, I was going to say, um, it's interesting you say about people being students of the games. Both of the guys that you mentioned there um, are both former sportsmen who are only a new sport and obviously studying where it all started and it's good to see them studying um, yeah it seems to it seems to have almost gone full circle i think with that where mm. um i think people only wanted to study or practice what they were seeing um on wwf or wwe television and, and that were where it were going i think it's it slowly gone full circle where um people are studying the the history of the game especially british um British wrestling, and undoubtedly, when you take all that into account, you, you try and sort of piece it all together. Dynamite and Davey are the uh, the glue that knits it all together, I think. A young lad you might like it as Kevin Lloyd, because he's out with the Wigan State Pit as a true trained catch pro wrestler as well, as a true catch as can wrestler, uh, Kevin Lloyd, or Sexy Kev sometimes when he's uh, told he's not enough fun. Right, I'll have to have a look. Uh, are we taking up a, 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 over an hour of your diamond? Thank you so much for coming on our show today. Uh, is uh, did anything else you'd like to say? No, I'm really happy. Really enjoyed it. I was gone by well, it's uh, oh well over an hour as you say. Gone really quickly. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Release date. Our oh, release date. Sorry. Oh yes, all that sort of stuff to cover. Um, yeah, release date is. Uh, officially the 4th of April uh, I am taking pre-orders already via various routes 
people can get in touch with me on social media. Uh, there's an eBay page set up, and but the the number one way is via my website, which is uh, stephenbellwrites.com. Uh, all my previous books are available there, um, and a pre-order for Dynamite Davy is available there. Uh, signed options uh, readily available. Uh, yeah, so my there's a dedicated Twitter page set up for the book as well, which is at Bulldogs Book One Two Three. Uh, it's just named Dynamite and Davy. Uh, I give regular sort of updates and exclusives there, some pictures, exclusive pictures, exclusive extracts. Uh, so if go ahead and give that a follow, and that's also got the instructions of how to pre-order. So uh, yeah, that'd be great. Super duper. Uh, I look forward to reading this book. Uh, as I say, so much of my childhood is around the Bulldogs and I can't wait to read it. Thank you so much for your time. And as we always say, don't feed the trolls. <laughs>